Hi guys, welcome to The Money Ladder, a series of conversations where I sit down with a few friends of mine and talk about their experience of climbing the ladder to success. Today, my guest that I've got with me um, is a guy that can be described probably as the James Bond of the real estate industry. He's been named one of the best negotiators in the country and also the coolest agent by the Financial Times. Ladies and gentlemen, help me to welcome Grant Bates. Thank you. How did I do for that intro? I mean, you've already <laughs> oversold me. I mean, that, that, yeah. is some, that is some pretty impressive accolades. Though. Thank you. Uh, but look, thank you for being here. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to have you. Um, you know, I think part of my process of really wanting to get information out there about the Money Ladder book is mm. talking to experts and people who are at the top of their field mm. um, and really get an insight into how they got to where they are and also perhaps impart some knowledge and wisdom that people can take. So I'll hopefully try. those, <laughs> yeah. Pressure. Those at home can sit back, take out your notepads and hopefully enjoy the show. So let's get straight into it, Grant. I'd love to kind of talk a bit about, you know, what you're currently doing. Mm. Uh, so you are the head of private client at Hamptons based in London. Yeah. Uh, and you sell multi-million pound homes and you make it look pretty easy. Mm. Yeah. It's not, but yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it isn't. Tell me a bit about what mm. got you into real estate. Why did you choose property? Uh, to, to be honest with you, I, if I'm going to be super candid, I didn't really have much of a choice. Right. Um, without going too deep with it, I wasn't the most well behaved in school. Mm -hmm. um, I got expelled from a couple of schools, um, but I was always good at selling. Sure. Like my niche was uh, three CDs for ten pounds. If wow. anyone remembers CDs <laughs> pre uh, pre Spotify and everything else. Yeah. And uh, yeah, look, I was I was. Uh, a good salesperson, I guess. I was uh, charismatic in like a cheeky, chavvy sort of way, mm -hmm. but um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And my nan actually bought a book uh, called Artistic License with a title, but it was called Big Book of Careers. Wow. Yeah, and then like sandwiched between like environmental officer and something else, there was like a beacon of hope with a state agent. Yeah. And uh, yeah, look, it was like a non-degree contingent job. You got to wear a suit, you got a car. Bear in mind, I was 18, right? Mm. So I was like just excited to be in a suit and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and have a car. And uh, that's it, basically. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I sort of dove uh, head into it and realized quite quickly that I was good at it, mm. thankfully. Plus, um, and it just spiraled from there. I loved it. I yeah. absolutely loved it. I loved meeting people. I loved selling. I loved property. Um, my dad was also director of housing, uh, social housing at Islington Council. So there'd always been right. a bit of an interest in property there. Um, but I wish it was like a more glamorous story. I just sort of fell into it. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, I think that, told. that tends to be the case for a lot of yeah. people, actually. You mm. kind of naturally just walk into something and you yeah. find a passion for it. But where do you think you got that confidence from then? So in terms of being able oh, to man, be a good salesperson? Like, uh, confidence comes over time, right? Yeah. Like e even to this day when I'm doing things like this or when I'm doing any uh, media stuff or Instagram, there's always a little bit of uncertainty and there's always a lot of imposter syndrome and anxiety. I've always been like that and I still am. Yeah. But I really believe that keeps me quite humble yeah. uh, and it really pushes me. And there's no substitute for, for just experience, right? You have to just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And I always say one of my favorite quotes is you have to be prepared to look stupid yeah. to get good at anything. Mm -hmm. Like if you think about anything you've done, mm -hmm. when you started, you were rubbish. <laughs> whatever it was, whether it was football, whether it was a sport, whether it was gym, whatever it was, if you look back, and I always say to people, look at my first Instagram posts. Right. Like, please go back, because I leave it on there. I know a lot of people delete their grid yeah, when yeah, they get yeah, better. Yeah, as they get better. <laughs> I leave it on there because yeah. I die when I watch it. Right. Like, I think I'm wearing sunglasses inside. <laughs> Show it, like, How old are you try and tour this house. <laughs> I'd love to say 18. I think I was probably yeah. about 23, 20. No, no, that's a lie. My God, I was probably in my 30s. Wow. I'm 37 now. Yeah. 32. Yes, yeah, so you, don't, you don't really know when you yeah. start. But then the more you do something, the more confident you get and you just get better and better and better. But you have to have a lot yeah. of resilience to ignore people telling you you're crap, sure. yeah, <laughs> basically, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and push through it and just, yeah, you grow as a person, you get better. Amazing. And look, we'll talk a bit about mm. the resilience and I guess what it takes to survive once mm. you get uh, going in, in the industry. Um, but part of the book, um, The Money Ladder, talks about property mm. um, as an asset class, mm -hmm. you know, as a way for people to generate residual income and to build their assets. But a, a very important part of the book as well talks about life in 2008 yeah. and previous. So obviously you've been in real estate mm. for over 20 years. So you operated at a time before the financial crisis yeah. and you reported <clears throat> after. What I'd like to understand from you really in your perspective is what was life like in property before 2008 crash? Because it was caused by 
Yeah, over leveraged. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was subprime mortgages. I mean, 2007 was nuts. Right. I've never seen a market like it. Like we had new developments where people were taking tickets. I'm not exaggerating. Right. They were taking tickets at the door to be a number that would be available to sit down with wow. you and potentially offer. It was like you have the luxury of being able to offer <laughs> on this property. Or if we showed a more standard house, not a new development, there were queues outside, you know, bidding wars. It was insane. Mm. And obviously hindsight's twenty twenty, but it was so obvious there had to be a tapering of that and there had right. to be a crash. Mm. And that obviously came in the form of 2008. And it was obviously led by just over leveraged clients. I remember having some horrible conversations, you know, quite sad, actually, mm. conversations with clients where they'd lost their job. Um, and they were over leveraged on their asset and they had no option but to sell it at whatever price they could get. I had clients crying on the phone, you know, it was a really, really horrible time. Um, not to mention, you know, not, not to make it about me or, or to come across as selfish, but agents made very little money in that market, obviously. Sure, sure. I think we all struggled, but certainly yeah. I, I, I won't say what I am, but it was, yeah. I, I think I remember calling my dad and being like, can, can you please help me? Yeah, he yeah, couldn't, yeah, yeah. so yeah. there we go. But yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was a real struggle. Yeah. But it was a very different market. You know, that we're not going to see that market again. I think we've learned a lot of lessons from that market. Okay. Um, and I don't think we'll see a return to, mm. to over leveraged clients yeah. now just because of the amount of stress testing that's involved when you when you lend. Yeah, and, that, and that's really interesting because mm. I think, you know, a lot of the time people talk about potential property crashes, mm. you know, whenever there's a change in the markets and the mm. economy. And I assume that they always refer back to sort of a 2008 style crash. Mm, but mm. as you said, that's probably something that's not on the cards. No, I, I don't think you're going to see that market again. I mean, yeah. I, I, that, weren't they lending at like 120%? Well, exactly. They were, that, they were basically yeah, yeah. giving you the house for free and then yeah. giving you money to renovate it and buy furniture. Buy furniture. And yeah. they weren't stress testing rigorously enough. So you had clients that couldn't afford their property. Yeah. What the banks were, were, were banking on yeah. uh, and what the government were banking on was, was increasing asset value, right? Sure they were banking on the property market um, increasing so that their security would be safe, their investment would be safe, and everyone's happy. Sure. But anyone that was buying towards the back end of 2007 or 2007 in general, they were always gonna catch a cold because yeah. there was it was just far too leveraged. Yeah. But we're not in that market now, like I say. No. The stress testing is, is a lot more detailed. Yeah. Um, and I think also there's a lot more, uh, as per the book, yeah. uh, there's a lot more education out there now to yeah. stop people making those types of, you know, dare I say it, slightly ignorant choices. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't think we'll, we'll be in that situation again. And do you think because of the fact that it was almost free game prior mm. to the crash, were people being careless in terms of the type of properties they bought? You know, as you said, if people were yeah, queuing up definitely. with tickets, just grabbing whatever they could mm. find, were they then not perhaps making strategic moves in terms of what assets they bought? Yeah. And was that also part of the problem in 100%. terms of how much they suffered when the crash came? Yeah, there, there was a herd mentality. And right. I think there was probably a lot of psychological uh, psycho, uh, psychology involved in yeah. the sense that if you lose uh, perhaps one or two sealed bids or bidding wars or whatever you want to term it, yeah. um, you're just so desperate to find a asset, particularly if you've been fed a line that the market's going to continue to increase. Sure. You want to buy that asset as soon as possible so yep. you can see the return on the investment. Right. So yeah, I'd say towards the end, there probably was like a fear of loss mm. um, and a herd mentality. And I think competition got the better of people where they, as you say, they yeah. bought assets that maybe in hindsight weren't the best investments of course. Um, and they didn't think it through. Yeah. Okay, so post 2008, we're now in a very different market. We've had mm. lots of different, um, you know, situations to deal with Brexit, COVID and everything else. What do you see now as the mentality for property buyers? Look, I think there is always going to be that mentality to secure an asset. I think as a as a nation, I know from a young age, it's always been fed to me, you know, buy property, buy property, bricks yeah. and mortar, safe as houses, all the all the typical phrases. Um, and I do think there's a lot of value in that because I right. think there's a lot of confidence in the market longer term. Mm -hmm. So that property as an asset class is like most asset classes, right? It ebbs and flows year to year. Sure. But if you take a longer term view on it, yeah. it's incredibly resilient, particularly in a, in a location like London where we've got a growing population mm -hmm. um, and we've got finite supply of the most desirable asset uh, uh, type of uh, property anyway, like period property. You can't build any more of it. Mm -hmm. And the fundamentals that guide any value, uh, any asset value, mm -hmm. Uh, is supply and demand. Right. So if there's not enough demand of something that, and there's a growing population, there tends to always be too much supply. Yeah. Um, so in terms of where the market's headed, uh, I think that 
a lot more people are placing confidence in long-term assets. So there's sure. maybe less focus on the investment angle, right. but certainly as a life choice and buying assets confident in the capital growth over time, I don't mm. think we'll, we'll ever see an end to that in London. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's take it back a bit then, just to mm. understand a bit more about your journey. As I yeah. said, this is around understanding how you climb the ladder to yeah, success. Yeah. Um, and at a very young age, you was running a branch in Islington. Yeah. Tell me a bit about that experience. Scary. Yeah. Yeah. It was the is actually uh, the UK's highest performing branch. Wow. Um, in terms of uh, not to be crass, but in terms of income and transaction numbers. Sure. And then I think it was second to the enemy one year, who I won't plug on this on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, super successful branch. It it was scary mm. and it was stressful and it you know bouts of imposter syndrome because yeah. i'd came from being a negotiator assistant manager but nothing really prepares you for running such a huge uh, a huge branch you yeah. know where there is this weight of expectation on you to be to be performing um and the board and the people at the top you know then they're, they're not going to be emotional about it you know they're, they're going to look after you where they can but ultimately yeah, yeah. they need to see the numbers on the board yeah so it was incredibly stressful but um I built a really strong team there that I was able to give a lot of autonomy to mm -hmm. so that I could lead as yeah. opposed to manage. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I should publicly declare this, but I, I don't really like managing, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I like leading, <laughs> I like leading, I like cap capable people that I lead. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think a lot, not to sound like the player you know, being interviewed at the end of a match, but it, a lot of it was down to the team, right? Yeah, like yeah, I yeah. built a really strong team there. Right. And I think the key for anyone going into that position is making sure that you have a brilliant team around you that you don't need to babysit Fine. and a team that uh, are all there completely on merit. And I'd say the biggest factor, and I think this is universal across all industries, but definitely in the property industry, is just work ethic. Right. You know, I wasn't necessarily looking for people with um, pedigree right. or, or a black book. I was looking for people that I knew would hustle mm. and I knew people that would, would work hard and people that would, <clears throat> excuse me, people that would respect me yeah. um, and have that line. It's a bit of a cliche, but if you can create that line in a team where yeah. you're as much of a friend as you are a colleague, mm -hmm. that is incredibly powerful because you'll all break your backs for each other. Yeah. And I think that's what we had there. Yeah. I get quite sad thinking about it because it was a 10, you know, 12 years, 10 years of my life that yeah, I was yeah. there. Amazing. And I've had to leave that team to do what I'm doing now. Sure. But, uh, and, and we go again, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a, I'm just gonna rebuild that team. I'll slowly start bringing them all over. Yeah, no, um, I mean, that's incredible. And I think, you know, doing that at a young age as well shows, mm. you know, that sort of capabilities, resilience, and perhaps maybe your natural leadership mm. um, skills that you have. But so looking at you now as, you know, head of private clients for Hamptons mm. in London, you're still one of the youngest in terms of the senior <clears throat> yeah. hierarchy of Hamptons. Yeah. So how do you navigate that then? So you've gone from a position where mm. as a young, branch manager or leading that office which is you know returning very good results for the company you've now stepped into a role where you've got much more sort of autonomy but mm. you're still one of the youngest mm. how do you sort of battle that well i think uh look, age is no guarantee of innovation or experience mm. right and i've always said i haven't always said i've always said it but i articulate i found it in a book articulated perfectly the other week and that is lean into your absurdity okay so what i mean by that is you can be you can be meh to 100% of people mm. or 50% of people can not like you and 50% of people can like you, but you're going to do more business with the 50% that like you. Right. So I think I just, I am just leaning into what I know I'm good at, right? I'm younger, I'm dynamic. I maybe resonate with a different wealth group to traditional private offices of the past. Sure. Um, I can still hold my own with, with more traditional wealth yeah. and more than hold my own. But certainly, I think what we're trying to build with this private office is a different view on wealth. Okay. And that it doesn't have to be the way you maybe think it has to be. Mm. It, it, and I've got to be careful how much I, how much I say here and how I, how I <clears throat> articulate things. But not everyone wants to be dealing with a certain type of wealth advisor sure. or property advisor. Yeah. And uh, as much as you're making me feel underdressed today, I, d I don't think there's anything wrong with you. With... You've turned out fine. Don't worry about that. <laughs> the Jordan's yeah, on. Um, I, I don't think there's anything, you know, wrong with maybe uh, dressing a bit differently or yeah. um, uh, dealing with people uh, with a bit more personality and a bit sure. more personable mm. um, and being slightly less formal. Mm. You know, I, I, without going too far into this, I often see formality as a weakness. Right. 
I think formality is a bit of a safe space that people defer to right. because they're not entirely comfortable to be themselves and to and to show themselves, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like formality is safe, yeah. yeah, yeah like yeah, if you yeah. go into a if you go into a meeting where you're uncomfortable, you're default to be informal because yeah. it's safer. I think but, I'm, I'm going to stop wearing suits now. Then I'm, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm listen, gonna, I'm going to rock up in track suits. If, and if, <laughs> if I could dress like you, I'd be wearing a suit all the time. No, but that, I think that's a really inter interesting perspective. Mm. And just talking about that sort of imbalance, and perhaps maybe maybe might feels to me like a culture shift. Mm. So you're in a, a pretty traditional sector, yeah, selling properties. And you've taken a very modern approach to mm. it. And so your social media following, you've got a large audience of people mm. that interact with you based on the way that you're able to showcase these properties. Mm. Tell me a bit about how you handle that then in terms of being part of an old establishment in an old established yeah. sector and bringing that modern sort of touch to it. How mm. do you battle that? And what, what is the view of the organisation, the business, and how do they sort of receive it? Yeah, well, the, the organisation and the business... Hopefully they don't mind me saying, but when I, when I, well, it's too late now because I'm going to say <laughs> it. When I started the, the whole Instagram page and the social media, yeah. they, uh, they told me to stop. Right. Yeah, they told me to stop. And I just took the view that it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, just right. carried on anyway. Yeah. Uh, and I got a few angry emails. Right. Um, but then I managed to show them that we'd earned a significant amount of fees and we'd procured a significant amount of business. Right. Obviously, I tactically waited a couple of months before I sent them those <laughs> screenshots. Uh, and then I think there, from there, there was just complete buy-in. Right. And I think they saw there was room for both. Right. Right? Like, I, th I think that being slightly different, mm. certainly for a head of private office, mm. um, within a corporate establishment is only a benefit because mm. it's the best of both worlds, right? Yeah. We've, you know, we've got this huge... Uh, world-renowned corporate establishment with the biggest international affiliation in the globe with um, a, a Hong Kong desk, a Dubai desk, um, RDI, Lettins, private, you know, it's huge yeah. uh, establishment. But then you've also got this slightly niche, almost bespoke, slightly disruptive mm. private office. Mm. So if you're a client trying to choose between maybe your traditional uh, agency right. or your more bespoke uh, social media driven personality then you've got both yeah. with us so and, and I guess just it. as you as you were speaking then I mm. thought perhaps for the listeners and, and viewers tell me tell me a bit about the private office element of it so yeah. why would someone choose to come to the private office mm. to, to buy a home so the the private office is all client-led right mm. so we only deal with our most um, affluent clients right. uh, who have the most desirable assets mm. um, and a lot of those clients, a lot of the wealthier clients, they want convenience, sure. right? So with a private office, like any offering, I guess, at that sort of level of wealth, it's all about taking care of the client first. So whatever they need, yeah. we property related, or sure. maybe not actually within reason, um, I'll, I'll be able to help. Yeah. So it, I, I, for example, you know, I have a client that's, um, listed a house at i guess a relatively low price point for what you typically associate with private office right. but it's all client led this particular client is public eye he's building his wealth there are other assets there's other avenues mm -hmm. he's doing a renovation project elsewhere so everything is client led right. so for that client he comes to me and he says i want you to help me project manage this development in south london fine I need an interior designer, fine. Mm -hmm. I need advice on colors, fine. I need someone to cut the keys, fine. I've got something to sell north of it, fine. Right. Basically, he only needs to speak to me. Right. So you have this huge organization below, but you're shielding them from any of the stress associated with that, and they are solely dealing with you. Right. Um, and I guess also, you know, these clients want to be dealing with someone senior. Yeah. You know, they want to be dealing with someone important. Um, so they know they're being looked after. Mm -hmm. So from from their side of uh, from their point of view, they're dealing with one person, yeah. but they're getting everything they need from that one person. Sure. So I just have to take all the stress, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, well, so you it's, delegate it's, to the team. It, yeah, <laughs> the yeah, partially. You don't I can do. be a bit of a control freak. I yeah. need to delegate more, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's all client led, right. and they'd come to us if they want that. You know what it says on the tin is an all encompassing approach to your sure. property journey, right. um, and that's effectively what it is. You know, yeah. we handle absolutely everything from investment to uh, purchase for them to live in whatever it might be we we assist fine so it's a holistic service a 360 mm. a bespoke tailored exactly approach that you exactly take to it. yeah you mentioned something earlier on about being different 
mm. when we were talking about you know your use of social media and how you've translated that into quite a traditional market. Mm. In your view, what makes a good negotiator if you're in this market? Um, I think resilience. Mm -hmm. I think work ethic. I think humility. There are way too many egos in our industry. Right. Way too many. Mm. Um, and just just on that, what do you mm. think has caused that? Because I think there's a lot of dramatization and, sens and you know sensationalizing mm. selling property. You know, especially at the end where you operate. Mm. You know, you turn your TV is all these kind of million mm. pound, million dollar sort of home shows, etc. Yeah. Do you think that's driving some of that ego, or what actually is it? Uh, yeah, possibly. You know, when I became an estate agent, I became an estate agent because it was one of the options available to sure. me. Yeah. It wasn't cool then, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. selling you know, flats above takeaways in Sudbury. It wasn't cool. Yeah. Uh, and yes, obviously the property shows have made it appear cool. Right. So you have a lot of people that come into the industry and think they know everything yeah. because they've watched Selling Sunset. Right. I mean, yeah. I'm telling you now, it doesn't work like that. Right. I can't think of one single scenario where I've closed a deal within five minutes and right. three phone calls. It doesn't, doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, <laughs> oh, you've got an offer. Okay, great. Yeah, no, you need to go to this. Okay, deal done. Yeah, sign the pet. No, <laughs> yeah. no, it doesn't work like that. So but I think, unfortunately, there's this desire for this short, this quick fix. Mm. And that the amount of messages I get, and I do try and respond to them as much as I can, but the amount of messages I get saying, how do I, how do, I do it? You know, I want to work in luxury real estate. Oh, do you? Okay, well, I'll take you back 20 years and then you can start. It, 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 every career is the same, right? Mm. I mean, of course, some people will be in a position where they can be privileged and have a bit of a leg up into an industry. Sure. But most um of the time it comes down to work ethic and how much you want it mm -hmm. you know it's the it's the you know the old saying of you know what, what is it like overnight success or mm. um i can't remember now but basically it takes a long long time and you've got to be prepared to put in the graft so initially it takes 10 years to become an overnight success that's it yeah, yeah. thank you so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um yeah completely yeah. and and there's and i just think with with ironically even though i'm obviously big on it so i think social media has definitely fed that right but i don't think the ego side of agency is driven from that okay i think that's really driven from agents that you know show incredibly expensive property as i do yeah somehow like come into the conclusion that it's almost their property you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've, yeah i've made it i've no sure. it's not yours you're selling it you yeah know? and i just think we can never be we can never be so involved in ourselves that mm. we don't uh realize that it's the client and the property that, that are the most important yeah. thing it's not no, it's not you, yeah. It's interesting you use that analogy about you know selling Sunset and those programs yeah. that make it appear so easy. Yeah. But looking at your experience, do you remember when you made your first big transaction, your first big sale? I remember my I remember my first uh, my first sale like in town. Okay. In uh, yeah, I remember my first sale for Hamptons, and I remember my first sale uh, at Urban Spaces, which was a company I worked for. Shout out Urban Spaces. <laughs> A company I worked for before Hamptons, okay. and I remember my biggest deal at Hamptons. Um, you want specifics on that? Well, tell deal. me the experience. Like we said, it doesn't yeah. take two phone calls and actually go no. a bit higher, a bit lower. T talk us through yeah, that experience. I'm trying to your think big transaction, your first big transaction. Oh my! Okay, but one of one of my big ones was a couple of years ago. Okay. This is going to sound like quite glamorous, actually. I almost want to tell you the story of selling the two hundred thousand <laughs> pound flat in Sudbury, but. Um, yeah, my, my, my big deal I did last year, uh, fine. So uh, it was a place, I've got to be careful how much I say, it was a place in Hackney that was listed, uh, and when you hear the price, I, did, I, I didn't confuse my locations, it's Hackney, um, that we had on the market at 10 million pounds. Mm -hmm. Now we didn't have it on the market per se, mm -hmm. in the sense that I met this client, actually ironically through Instagram, right. very high profile clients, done a lot in the, in the like restaurant, industry and um when i met him i said i said the figure and he looked at me like i was mad because obviously that part of london those figures don't really exist but that type of property didn't exist right. unbelievable house mm. absolutely unbelievable and um we had an offer on it there was another agent sort of sniffing around we had it on the market for a year completely off market because a lot of these properties don't actually go to the open market sure and we had competing off, uh, offers on the property. I had one, the other client had another. And um, this is why I say it's gonna make it sound more glamorous. 
I was in the south of France, like not a big deal, right? I was just in, I was just <laughs> in, you Ca- do? Yeah, I was just course. in Cannes yeah, um, anyway. And uh, I remember I was meant to be on holiday with my family for a week and that didn't happen basically. I was on, I was on the phone the entire week wow. because we had the deal agreed. We thought it was all fine. And then this offer came in to effectively gazump the offer I had. And I had conversations with my buyer. The, the other issue was my buyer was mortgage. Okay. And the buyer, the competing buyer was cash, yeah. which at a level like we were dealing with in Hackney, which had never been seen before, that was a huge advantage because you have issues with bank surveys and everything else. Um, he was also trying to decide between the two offers because of that, one sure. being cash, one being mortgage. Anyway, it, I'll, I'll sell you the short version. I managed to get them to put down an incredibly outrageous, non-refundable escrow deposit okay. um, to secure the property and get, them, get that client to go with them over the cash interest. Mm-hmm. Um, it was then downvalued as well, uh, quite significantly. Yeah. Um, but again, I managed to get them to bridge the gap between the down valuation and the, sure. which was substantial. It was about over two million pounds wow. to bridge the gap to buy the property, uh, and then we closed it in a week. Wow. And that that's uh, that's the the very short version. Yeah. But my point is, I was meant to be on holiday yeah. with my kids mm. and my wife, yeah. and for that entire week, pretty much, I think it was one day where I wasn't working wow. and that's the reality yeah. that people don't see yeah. you know and sometimes I feel super guilty about it actually like the other day I was I'm crazy busy all the time and I was meant to be going to the gym and then off to client appointments and uh earmuffs Hamptons but I delayed I didn't cancel I delayed one of them and I didn't go to the gym and I just sat with my little man and watched Grizzly and the Lemons for a couple hours because yeah. the, the the work like the stress it puts on your life yeah. sometimes yeah is insane because yeah. th- also your clients expect to get you whenever of course especially if they're based in another country if they want to call you at midnight you have to try and make the time it's mm. crazy and yeah. people just see <laughs> selling sunset you know someone totter up in in uh, Le Boutons yeah. and sell a, a 20 million pound house it doesn't work like that I, th- I think that's really interesting I think yeah. look, part part of what I wanted to really demonstrate mm. with this book is about that that I think you know talking about success is nowadays made to look so easy yeah and perhaps we only paint a picture of the good times and perhaps we don't show enough about the detail mm. of what goes into it but just going back to your story around that transaction in east london you use a few terms which funny enough i cover in a jargon buster section mm-hmm. in this book you use the word gazump oh yeah just explain what gazump is in you know if i if i was telling my mate in the pub what gazumping is yeah uh not that i go to pub don't drink five years now good um Excellent. Gazump uh, is basically a, a buyer outbidding you effectively. Right. But the literal term of gazump is if you have a property under offer yep. and another cut buyer comes in and bids above what you've bid and basically steals the property from you. That's right. that's gazumping. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad that you're making references to the book already. Great book. Great book. <laughs> you must have uh, yeah. learned a lot from it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's interesting you talk about, you know, the, the family element of mm. it as well, uh, because, you know, clearly we all have a dream that we're chasing in terms mm. of business and financial success. Yeah. Um, but as a real estate um, professional expert, what does success look like for an agent? So is it about the amount of properties you sold or mm. is it more about the locations of properties you sold or is it the type of clients you deal with? What is success for a property agent? Um, I think in the literal success sense, like as in not success in your life, but yeah, success in your career, um, a lot of agents will default to numbers. Right. It's really about how much you've sold, excuse me, how many units, what's the, a lot of uh, agents will put the value of the units they've sold. Sure. So they'll put like, you know, half a billion's worth of yeah. sales transactions. So I think that's a, how a lot of people measure it. Right. For me, not in an arrogant way, I've been there and done that. Like sure. I've, I've hit huge numbers through my career. So for me, it's now about clients. Yeah. Like I, I want to get, some of the most high profile clients working with me that that's my goal right. um, because I also think in terms of legacy and future proof in my career and the company's career mm. that's what private office is about it's sure. about working with individuals and families long term mm. not just doing one transaction and moving on to the next sure. you want to be in a situation where if they need anything they call you that's it they want yeah. you know you want to, you want them to be whatsapping you yeah, yeah, yeah like friendly terms you know that's my goal sure. um and not in a contrived way at all like i just believe you know that for me is certainly an uh, evidence of success if you've got these incredibly successful people in their own right sure. that see you as yeah. the person to speak to they that's i think you, you need, 
Yeah. That's when I think you know you've yeah. nailed it. Yeah. Um, yeah. For sure. Okay. Um, well, look, I want to move on and talk a bit about, I guess, your experience of almost practicing what you preach. So mm. you're a real estate, you're an agent, but you've also built your own portfolio of property, mm. investment properties mm. on the side. And there's a chapter in this book where I, I describe the experience of uh, a character who does a similar thing, uses nine to five income to build a property portfolio. Talk me through why you sort of got into that. Uh, because often a lot of people who might work in a particular sector don't necessarily invest their time in that sector. So yeah. a lot of people in banking who don't even invest in stocks and shares, mm. for example. Mm. But what made you sort of go down that route of thinking, I want to build a property portfolio and talk us through that experience? Yeah, so I think uh, what made me go down the route, I think it was just the fact that I'd always been incredibly confident in property as an asset class. Sure. And maybe that's because it was fed by my parents or my grandparents or whatever. Yeah. You know, uh, right to buy, obviously, Maggie Thatcher days was huge. You know, the people that, 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 that bought their own council property yeah. tend to have done pretty well. Um, but look, I love my job, yeah. but I don't obviously want to be doing my job forever. Sure. Um, and, speak, you know, tip, tagging on to the back of your success question, mm. I, I want to be in a, possess a position where I don't need to work, right? right? That's what everyone's striving for. Like yeah. money gives you freedom and you yeah. just want to be in a position where you don't need to work. So I was incredibly confident in property as an asset class. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw that that as the best route to that freedom. And I also think it's strange you say about bankers not investing in stocks and shares because mm -hmm. the way I see it, and really it's only been the last few years when I've been in a position where I can really double down on, sure. on investing. I had to teach myself a lot of it. Right. Um, but surely you should be putting the bulk of your wealth into an asset class you understand. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like, okay, I'm fortunate enough that I've worked for this many years. I've now got this pot of cash I can invest. What am I going to do with it? Because most of my property portfolio has been in the last two years. It's okay. been a world, whirlwind two years. Interesting, yeah. Um, so it was logical for me to say, okay, well, 80% of that is going to go into property because I know sure. it. Yeah. It's my field that I know. Yeah. I'm going to put 10% in shares because I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, and we'll see how that pans out. And I put like 10% in art. Sure. Um, so I just think surely you would stick to an asset class that you understand. Yeah. Um, and that's why I did it. And also, in fairness, I did I did buy quite early. Okay. My first property. Sure. And then it obviously, le you leverage from there. Once you've got one, yeah. it makes life a lot, lot easier. Cause yeah. you can, you know, property is a lot more liquid than people perceive it to be. Mm -hmm. People perceive it as having your money locked up in a, in a house. Oh God, what am I gonna do? But no, it's yeah. a liquid asset. Yeah. You can take money out of it. You can. Uh, you can refinance. There's plenty of ways you can do it. Yes, you need to lock it in two, five years, but it's not like the States where you're locked in for 25 years, years or whatever it yeah. is until you sell. Yeah, yeah. So on, on that basis then, so I guess, you know, as a strategy of using it as a way that hopefully could become your retirement fund mm. or provide residual income, what do you look for when you're buying an investment property? Honestly, in terms of the immediate, we, when we spoke earlier about the ebb and flow of the property market, yeah. I don't overthink it. Right. I don't overthink the immediate because exactly. I know that as long as it's washing its face, yeah. I'm you, you'll make the bulk of your return on the capital growth. Sure. So I really don't overthink the, the, right. the, the sort of year to year analysis. What I would say as, as a sort of very quick summary is again, hinging back to that finite supply, supply and demand fundamental. Sure. I would be looking for period property okay. personally. Mm -hmm. It's more upkeep, but there are less of them. Finite supply, it will hold its value uh, well. Um, and I'd be looking for that in areas that are close to infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So um, I've, I feel like I've said Tottenham for years and it just doesn't seem to be turning, but Tottenham <laughs> is one for me. Right, you're waiting for that to I happen. Think, <laughs> I think will happen. Because, Emerging. Yeah, it's, it's basically as soon as you see a Gales open yeah. or you see women jogging with prams, buy, because that's, that's right. when the area is about to shift. Right. But um, in all seriousness, yeah, period property, finite supply, mm -hmm. Um, and something that's going to be easy to rent. So all of my assets, and it is more upkeep, but majority of mine are one and two bed flats okay. because they're, they're liquid, they're quick. Sure. You know, you're always going to have rental demand for those. Yeah. Um, I'd also say you'd be wise to lock them up in a, in a limited company at the moment, but right. I'm not an accountant, I'm not a tax sure. advisor, but that's definitely something I'd be looking at, particularly with the pivot in government likely end of this year. Yeah. Um, so yeah, period property, one, two beds, yeah. um, 
near to infrastructure. Okay. And you also often hear the mm. saying that buy the worst property on the best street. Yeah. Is there a truth in that? Is that a wise investment strategy? There is if it's all down to your numbers, right? Mm. Yes, in broad strokes, yes. Assuming that you're buying it at, at a value where you've got the margin. Sure. And I'd be very careful about that at the moment because um, material costs are through the roof and yeah. renovations are so expensive at the moment. Mm. And we haven't had a, I don't think we've came to a point yet where the client's selling them understand the reality, sure. i.e. so they're not giving the margin in their sale price. Yeah. But yeah, as a loose term, mm. yes. Mm. Like location over everything, sure. obviously. Yeah. Because those locations are great locations for a reason and mm. the, they tend to hold their own in terms of capital growth. Yeah. So if you had to choose between location, price and condition, what's the most important? location yeah. yeah so even looking at the cost of materials and everything else if you found something that was really derelict but in a good location you would still go for that yeah, yeah. i think it's locate I, I think location beats everything hands down right um because it's the it's the one thing you can't change of course you know yeah. everything else you can change yeah. interior design you can change yeah. you know location you can't shift it yeah um and reality is if it's in a poorer location you're getting it at a lower price but it's all relative sure it's all relative in the end and you'd much rather particularly if you it depends how risk adverse you are right yeah if you want a safe bet Mm -hmm. then yeah go for location all the time yeah and what are your views on perhaps some of these more modern ways of buying property so you've got the physical type yeah and there's something i talk about in the book in terms of your options of owning property you can buy the bricks and mortar or you might do one of these crowdfunding sort of group yeah. investments online where you buy a portion of a property, yeah. you might get some rental income, and when it gets sold, you get some capital back. Mm. What is your view on that? A good friend of mine has one of these companies, actually, right, okay. so I've got to be slightly careful what I say. <laughs> uh, the truth is I don't understand it, right. and I'm not going to sit here and pretend. Okay. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm humble enough to accept I still don't know everything at 37. Sure. And I don't fully understand it yet. Mm. I understand the premise, sure. like it enab- enables you to get on the ladder quicker and you have a share in that property. And the yeah. concept of it, I yeah. think, could be huge. Yeah. Um, and I'm all for innovation. Mm. So I think it could be huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, and whether I sound like an old man or not, I still feel more comfortable knowing that I own the entire asset. Yeah. Like I, I would still feel more comfortable waiting. Sure. Like, for example, you may know and uh, something that I don't. But how do you decide when you sell that property if there's 20 people that own a portion of it? Yeah, you don't. They decide for you. So yeah, it's so normally that... run like a fund where they run it on a course of, say, five years or so. Yeah. They then make the, the decision to sell. Then the investors get And it's like majority back. vote. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, that would um, make me nervous. Yeah. Because if I was in a situation where I wanted to trade and right. I got out, outvoted, you know. I think it depends. If, if I think personally... That is something you would maybe invest in once you've got the basics right. Sure. You know, if you've got a portfolio of 20 behind you yeah. and you're relatively liquid and you're not in a situation where you'd need to sell fine, yeah. I wouldn't use it as a substitute to being on the market. Like I wouldn't have that as your only asset, sure. i.e. I can get in quicker, so I'm going to buy that. I wouldn't, right. I wouldn't look at that. No. Okay. And so let's try and answer perhaps the most frequently asked questions when it comes to real estate, Grant. When is the right time to buy a property? I wish I knew. I don't, I don't know. So do I actually. Today. Call me today. Right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 I genuinely practice what I preach, mm. I promise you, in the sense that I don't overthink it. I focus very much on the long term. Right. I've said it a couple of times, but the market, like any asset class, it ebbs and flows. Yeah. If you overthink it, you are going to drive yourself insane right. trying to time. You can't time it. Mm. You know, the best time to buy was 20 years ago. The next right. best time is today, right? Like, it's just fact. Right. You don't know. Yeah. So I really don't think we can overthink it. You know, if we knew that we, we'd be in a situation where we were at 4 or 5% rates, mm. we would have all locked in for 10, 20 years when we were at 1, 1 and a quarter yeah. percent. Yeah. So... I don't think you can overthink it. I think you just have to run your numbers and make sure you're going to be financially comfortable Mm -hmm. and view it long term. The house price index, for Mm -hmm. example, in London shows an average annual return of 8%. That's insane. Mm -hmm. Similar to the stock market, right? The S&P or Mm -hmm. or the FTSE, the return over a longer period, what is it, like 8 similar, like 10% a year or whatever. That's what you've got to focus on. I don't think you should ever Mm -hmm. buy any asset class if you're thinking that you could need to sell it in a year or two. That is insane because then you don't know where the market is going to be and you're leaving yourself open like 2008. Sure. So you believe in playing the long game? 
Always, yeah. Always, unless you're mental, yeah, and you really <laughs> like a gamble. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I mean, there it. are some other asset classes that I think people can use to, uh, you know, scratch that itch if they yeah. need to. You know, cryptocurrency, yeah. for example, is is one such example. Yeah. Um, but I want to go back to a point you made earlier on about the cost of, you know, renovating properties now, mm. and perhaps some owners not really understanding the implications yeah. of that in the current market. A lot of people have this vision of buying a property, renovating and selling it or flipping, right? Which is what is commonly referred to as. If somebody wants to do work to their property, mm. what things should they do that can add value? Because not everything adds value, no. right? But what are the things that could add value if they spend money on? Do you know who's responsible for that? Sarah Beanie. Okay. Yeah, and the property programs in the 90s. I feel like every channel I turned on, there was a property program that said you could make money renovating your house. I mean, you, you can, yeah. you can, but right. yeah, you've got to be tactful about sure. what you do. Yeah. And I don't think it's as simple as saying, do a side and rear extension or do a loft extension. What you need to do is you need to look at the demographic in that area, right? right? So for example, if you've got a five bedroom house mm -hmm. and the demographic in that area need three and four beds, there's no point spending your money adding a six bedroom because right. it's not going to increase the value. Fine. As a very, bro very broad stroke, pounds per square foot is how we value property, right? So the more space you can add, the more it's worth. Right. But then it's more complex because you can be oversized or undersized and then it's not the same pounds per square foot return. Mm -hmm. So that part of it, you have to be slightly careful with. If I was really pushed for an answer, mm. if you and it even varies on property type. If you've got a traditional townhouse that's tall and thin, you want to make it wider, so you do a side and rear, right? And then it's more appealing. Right. But as a very broad answer, you'd want to spend your money on, on where you can add the most space right. and where people spend the most time, which right. is why you see so many people doing side and rear extensions. Sure. But also... Do it so that you're do it so that you, it's going to improve if it's where you own if you yeah. live there. Do it for you mm -hmm. so that you enjoy living there, right. and the investment will take care of itself. Right. Also, the other point to add is big big premiums are being paid for turnkey homes at the moment. Right. So I don't know if you have that in your jargon busters, but turnkey okay. basically means renovated, right? Sure. Um, because material costs are so high. Right. And also because I think there was a big lifestyle shift post COVID where people just cannot be bothered, right. choice of words, bothered with doing the work anymore. Yeah. Um, I think people have prioritized their life over doing a year's worth, two years worth of renovations. Right. So they'll pay a premium if they can buy a property that's renovated. Yeah. Um, and be bold when you renovate as well. Don't, don't, I'm just checking the color of the walls. Don't, uh, don't <laughs> yeah. paint it all white or yeah, magnolia. Yeah. And so all the cosmetics then. So I think yeah. sometimes people, and I think it's a good point you make about, you know, if you're staying there, then mm. do it to your taste, something you yeah. enjoy. But I think sometimes people may get carried away with the cosmetics and the aesthetics that yeah. looks good and therefore I think it's going to sell for more. But as you said, there's quite a lot more that needs to be considered and it doesn't mm. just come down to the looks itself. No, it doesn't just come down to the looks. It, it, you know, it's always going to be subjective from buyer to buyer. Yeah. I do actually think the aesthetics are super important though, because okay. realistically, the houses or the properties that sell for the most money or ahead of where they should perhaps, yeah. it's all emotional. Okay. It, you know, if you're selling to an end user market, end user is someone that's gonna live in their home, yeah. not investment, it, it's all emotion. Right. I.e., if you walk into a house and you absolutely love it, I always compare it as an asset class more to a piece of art. Mm -hmm. So it has a residual value, yeah. but if you love it, you will pay over the odds to secure it sure. because you just want it. Yeah. So that's where I think the aesthetics are super important. Right. But obviously, yeah, look, don't, don't, don't wallpaper your, all your walls in like leopard print. Don't go crazy, <laughs> but just- There's some no return features, on that investment. <laughs> no, no, yeah. you have lost your money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but just sections of that, you know, be yeah. bold with your design to some yeah. degree, but just don't do anything that can't be changed. Yeah, yeah, you okay, know? important, yeah, yeah, good point. So look, talking about emotions then, and I think this is something that even sometimes I think about. So, you know, I've been financing and lending against properties for over 10 years. Mm. And there is a lot of emotion involved in it. But from the angle of being an agent and selling these properties, where do you get the sort of values from when, you know, you reach the sort of 20, 30 million pound properties? Because it comes to a point where yeah. it's just a numbers game, surely, because yeah. sure, okay, postcode counts for something and the size counts for something, but 50 million pound property. Talk how? me through how you get there. How? Yeah. I mean, believe me, before I started valuing, I thought I felt the same. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, how do you determine if something's 50 or 60 or <laughs> exactly. 70 or 100? Yeah. Um, 
and pro probably the truth is you don't always you know a lot of it is client-led right because clients with this sort of wealth they don't need to sell right. you know they're selling if they get their price otherwise they're not selling mm -hmm. but of course there is there is objective data that goes into it sure so typically the way you would structure it is like you would any other price point you'd look at the comparables sure the only difference maybe being you if it was a 50 million pound house on a certain street mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily just look at the average pounds per square foot for that location because it would completely skew the data sure you'd probably look at all of the trades in london in the last two years between 40 and 60 mm -hmm. and you'd work out where the pounds per square foot was and then you'd say mr vendor this is loosely where i think the value is between x and x you know with a bit of traction we might be able to get here yeah. and then you'd have an open it'd be a dialogue that you would have sure. it's not it's it's very different to the level of the market that i started in mm -hmm. where you'd go in and say mr vendor number 21 sold for this number 33 sold for this number 15 sold for this you've got a slightly better garden so we think you're worth this right. no you yeah. know it's a, there's it's a lot more collaborative there's sure. a lot more conversation to be had and also at that end of the market it, it depends the finish can shift the dial massively right and whether the artwork and the furniture and so that's the aesthetics that we we're talking about earlier yeah on. i mean yeah. look I've, I've got a house at 65 million mm -hmm. i can't say where it is um but the chandelier mm -hmm. yeah this is a light it's a light it's a chandelier mm -hmm. half a million pounds wow it's like so that immediately shifts the dial wow. or if they've had a world-renowned interior designer do the entire place or a world-renowned architect that adds a that adds a brand and value. Right. So ultimately, it is the old adage of it's worth what someone will pay for it. Sure. Um, and a lot of these properties as well in London that there aren't as many as you think, mm. right? So if you want to live in London, you need that amount of space. Sure. There are only a handful of roads you can buy on. Right. Um, so we'd obviously look at what precedent has been set on those roads. Yeah, yeah. But the super prime market, you know, Mayfair, for example, above mm. 10 million had a record year last year. Mm. So clearly, you know, that demographic, they'll yeah. to some degree will pay what they need to pay to if it's them. the right house for them. Yeah. yeah, yeah but yeah. they just, they take a lot longer to sell, as you can imagine. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, time. It's, it's fascinating because you're right. Yeah. I mean, you get to a level where you think, sure, there's some guest game in here. I mean, you know, an 80 million pound yeah. property, you think, uh, yeah, mm. yeah. <laughs> a, bit, a bit of that, right, <laughs> uh, to get there. Now, uh, what I want to talk about is the difference between selling a house off market mm. versus selling one sort of on market per se. What is the benefits and why do certain clients choose to sell the house off market? Most clients at my end of the market are off market for discretionary reasons. Right, okay. Particularly if they're in the public eye, they yep. don't want people to know. Yep. And security, yep. you know, as, as sad as it is, um, we do live in, you know, a country or a city where there is crime, as yeah. I think most major cities. Yeah. And I think security is probably the biggest one. Right. You know, you're never going to see a 50 million pound house on right move mm. because it, you just make yourself a target. It's not sure. difficult to work out where that house is. Right. Um, hence why we, we can't always shoot them. We can't always provide photos. We have to blur artwork. We can only have conversations on the phone. We can't email any details. We have to yeah. password and encrypt details. Like it's all to do with discretion and security. And I think there is a bit of um, psychology involved in the sense that once a property is out there, mm -hmm. uh, there's not as much prestige around it. You know, once everyone's seen it, yep. for a buyer that's got that sort of wealth, it's like, mm, it's less exciting. Sure. Whereas if I'm calling you and I'm saying, Franklin, I know you want a house on this road. Yeah. Please God, you've got 50 million in a few years. Um, you need to come and see this house. I've only called you. Right. So-and-so is selling it. You know him from blah, blah, blah. If I can give that information, I might not sure. be able to scratch that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So it's, it's all discretion, mm -hmm. security, and to keep it exclusive and to keep an element of prestige around the listing. Yeah. And how involved do you get in, you know, so you get uh, given a property to sell and you walk in, you know, we talked about the aesthetics and, you know, all the things that adds to the value of it. Mm -hmm. How involved are you with that staging process when you walk in? Oh, yeah. Fully. Yeah? Yeah. Fully. And, like, because we, we, they're... they're at that level, they're employing us to advise them, right? right. They don't always listen to the advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they sometimes just say no. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're advising on every element. Yeah. I mean, fortunately, at that, at that price point, most of the properties are beautifully 
finished already. Sure. Um, so there's not a huge amount of advice. Right. And you know they've you know it's not their first rodeo, right? Sure. They've sold and listed loads of properties before. So specifically on the staging elements and the design elements, there's maybe less that we have to suggest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're heavily involved. You right. know, we, we'll spend. I'll spend personally like two hours walking wow. around the property yeah. with the chief of staff, like noting down every, because you have some buyers at that level that just want to be left alone. Yeah. Like they want you to send the details to their agent and you just basically stand behind them and let them look. Okay. Um, you feel like a real lost part, just like, mm, okay. <laughs> um, and then there's others that want the whole grandiose, you know, drama and they yeah. want the American like, this is the kitchen well i can see it's the kitchen but you still have to like you know then they, they want full information on absolutely everything so we need to be prepared to be able to tell to answer any question sure um and sometimes we don't know and we have to come back to them but we, yeah, yeah. we try and obviously make sure we know as much about the house as possible yeah amazing so look i think the work you do on that end of the scale for me is probably mm. at the higher end of the money ladder right? yeah but if we'd sort of take a few steps down back yeah. to where perhaps some of the people listening or watching this might be in their in their in their yeah, lives at course, the moment yeah. so somebody who's thinking about getting into property mm -hmm. right uh, and they're listening or they're watching this right now where's the best place to start in terms of looking at locations and things like that so where would you put your money if you had to invest, thinking, you know, we've got a national audience here, right? So we're in the UK. Where would you start? I'm giving away my secrets now. I've got, <laughs> I, I've got a, oh, okay. I'm just going to say it because I'm a nice guy. I've got a, a lot of property in Darlington. Okay. Yeah, shout out Darlington. Shout out Darlington. Great place. Why Darlington? Uh, why Darlington? Because, first of all, there is going to be the first treasury outside of London. Mm -hmm the only other one in the UK that's going to be open in there. Um, they've invested 200 million in the train station. Okay. So it's two hours. It's, yeah, Darlington's going to blow up now. It's good I've got properties. Um, <laughs> well, after this anyway, two, everyone's going yeah, to be investing. There's 200 million pounds going into the uh, train stations. Yeah. Did I say this already? Two hour connection into London. Yeah. Um, and, there, and Amazon HQ are there. So in terms of the rental, um, if you're buying them to rent. Sure. And it's crazy what you can buy for there. Really? Yeah, like two bed. I bought my first two bed, two bath house there mm -hmm. uh, for 52,000. Wow. And the yield is like 10%. Wow. Um, plus you, plus obviously with all the aforementioned points, I think there's going to yeah, be yeah. good capital growth. Right. So as an investment angle, Tarlington. Amazing. Um, and, uh, but so that's a great one actually for budget as well, sure. because that, yeah. so to, to put it into, I guess, uh, more colloquial terms, you need 20, 25,000 mm -hmm. loosely all in sure. to be able to buy an asset there. Yeah. So that's, I think, a pretty good, mm -hmm. uh, relatively achievable um, okay. investment. I really like that because I think mm. a lot of the time, most things are London centric. Yeah. And of course, look, everybody would like to, you know, try and own a piece of land or, or property or yeah. space in London, but it's becoming more and more difficult for yeah. people to achieve that. You know, the average house price in the UK is nearing 300,000. Mm. The average incomes aren't really keeping pace with, yeah. you know, how quickly uh, property prices are going up. So I think that is really, you know, an interesting perspective in yeah. terms of, you know, somewhere that maps most people haven't considered before. Yeah, I don't think anyone has. Uh, <laughs> until now, until <laughs> I now. think we've put Darlington uh, on the map, guys. We've put Darlington on the map. <laughs> Bloody love Darlington. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, I, th I think it's a good spot. And like yeah. I say, it's... it's uh, and it's fun because you yeah. can, you know, because it is relatively achievable at right. 2025, 20, you can yeah. buy two or three, yeah. like, and yeah. you can leverage each asset sure. and keep going, you can get yourself a bit of a portfolio yeah. uh, up there. Um, yeah. Let's talk about leveraging a bit. Mm. So, I mean, for most people, a property is likely to be the most expensive thing they ever buy. Yeah. And therefore, it really matters how you make that purchase. Yeah. So in your experience, both as an agent, but also building your own portfolio, how important has it been building the right relationship with banks and lenders to give you that leverage to be able to scale up and climb the ladder? Yeah, yeah, it's crucial. I mean, obviously, luckily, I'm in the industry, so I've right. got some brilliant contacts in that space. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, just, just the same service I provide, you really want to have a go-to sure. advisor in that situation and yeah. someone that you trust and yeah. someone that advises you on how to, on how to leverage. Um, the only point I would maybe make there is do remember 
not anyone I recommend, they're great, but do remember mortgage mortgage yeah. brokers are technically salespeople. Sure. Not not all of them, but they technically are. Yeah. So to also make sure you're taking advice from an accountant or, yeah. or a proper financial advisor mm-hmm. that can be objective mm-hmm. um, rather than a broker. Yeah. But definitely go to someone that's whole of market sure. for sure. Don't yeah. just go direct to your bank. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, c- crucial. You want to be able to have that one person you can go to. It makes your life so much easier as well as you're building your portfolio. Yeah, completely. It's interesting, Grant, you're giving away all my secrets because in the book, I talk about the different types of advisors and whole yeah. market versus restricted advisor. Yeah. But going back to the point around mortgage brokers, for example, mm. I think it's really interesting because using a mortgage broker sometimes can get you a cheaper rate than going directly to yeah. a bank. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people know that no. or recognize that. Mm. And of course, like you said, you know, mortgage brokers are in it to win. And therefore, you know, they might be calling you every two years when your fixer's up to mm-hmm. say, hey, let's find out a cheaper deal for you because, you know, brokers get paid when they land a deal. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's something that a lot of people may not explore enough yeah. because they may not understand the benefits of using mm. a mortgage broker. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah. But again, on the idea of leverage, um, we were having this discussion when we last met um, and we went for a walk and we were talking about the psychology of when somebody is considered rich, you know, multimillionaire or billionaire, and they're deciding how much money they spend on a property, mm. 50 million, 100 million. Mm. And, you know, we had a conversation of, well, if I had that sort of money, would I want to spend that much on a property? Yeah. And it's almost as if at that end of the scale, you're sort of making a judgment based on, well, how much of my overall, overall wealth mm. am I spending on a house? Mm. Versus most people who actually are gearing up everything they have to buy a single yeah. house. What do you think it is that makes that conversation more sort of strategic at that level? Well, I think at that level it is, you mean at the, at the, at the at higher le- level? At the higher level. Yeah. Uh, well, look, yeah, at that level it is more strategic um, because you've got the luxury to be more strategic, yeah. right? You, you don't have to buy. Sure. You don't have to buy anything at yeah. that sort of level. So you've got the luxury of time. You've got the luxury of being able to be strategic. If you miss one property that you like, okay, you know, it's on to the next one. So um, a lot more time can be spent on it. And also if you're spending that sort of cash, Mm -hmm. you're not gonna rush into it, right? right? You're just not. You're gonna make sure you have all of your data before you dive in. Sure. Um, I mean, having said that, I'm sort of contradicting myself, but it's not always the case. There have been a few trades that, you know, they've walked in and just bought it because they have to have it. But most of the time it's because the money provides the options and they've got the options, they've got the luxury of time because they've got the wealth. So, you know, they they can afford to to think about it more broadly. And they're probably a lot more educated by that point. Mm -hmm. By the time they've got to that level of wealth, you know, they are more educated across all asset classes and across the whole market. Yeah. And I think that's a really important important point. It's about the education. I mean, I've heard sort of the saying um, in and around around about if you can't afford something twice, you shouldn't buy it. Yeah. And obviously that doesn't apply to property because if it no. did, then, you know, majority of the population yeah. will not never buy yeah, or yeah. own a property. Yeah. And so everything is about, you know, applying it within reason, really yeah. understanding the context behind what, what something means. Um, okay. So look, mo- moving on a bit then, and it would be a shame for me not to talk about your personal experience with finance, given that, you know, mm. the book, The Money Ladder talks about money and, yeah. you know, how, you behave with money and your experiences with it. Mm. So you talked a bit about, you know, your parents and kind of, you know, what they did in terms of their line of work, etc. But can you remember what your sort of early interactions with money was? When did you really start to understand the power of it? The power of it. I mean, I, I, I was always super money motivated, right. if I'm going to be honest, okay. you know, because I didn't. Again, we talk about people having, you know, their decisions based on their environment. Yeah. And uh I didn't have the luxury not to be right. I had to. I had to earn money. I didn't yeah. have a situation where my parents were just gonna gonna help me. Yeah. So my first experience of money was probably my dad started me with pocket money, okay. like five quid a week or yeah. whatever it was, and then I had a paper round. Okay. <laughs> from like I think it meant to be thirteen, but I was like shrewdly in there at like twelve, yeah, hustling yeah, yeah. away. Um, uh, so yeah, that was probably my first experience, and I and I got paid nine pounds a week, yeah. and I used to spend three pounds on, uh, this is way too much information. And now we like, 12, this is good. <laughs> I used to spend three pound on 12 packs of Premier League stickers. Wow. Because they're 25p a pack, I think they're like a quid now. Inflation, <laughs> killer. Uh, and then I used to save six pounds. Yeah. Um, so I'd always had it built into me that 
you should work hard, you should hustle, yeah. uh, and but you should and you should enjoy some of your money, but you should also make sure you're saving. Yeah. You know, my my parents are definitely from that generation of saving and pensions, and obviously that's pivoted. Sure. You know, people are, are definitely more comfortable with debt than they were. Yeah. Um, you don't just leave your money in the bank anymore. Mm. But that was probably my first experience of having to like manage money. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as I got older, as I said, for me, this. Uh, position I'm in now has all came quite quickly right and I think when you're younger and you are striving to be wealthy Mm. you want uh you know you want Louis Vuitton you want a Porsche you want a range that's what motivates you if you're from a situation where maybe you didn't have money initially and the only advice and I'm not even sure if you asked this but I'm going to give it anyway please is um don't yeah like don't buy it twice if you can't afford it twice don't buy it don't be spending your money on those sorts of things mm. when you don't have a house. Mm. Like, what are you doing? Mm. Like, no, that mm. comes later. Yeah. But I get that you are motivated by that, and I prob- And look, in fairness, I had a I had a Miami Vice BMW in white when I was <laughs> yeah. like 22, and I couldn't right. really afford it. So I'm sort yeah. of contradicting myself, yeah. but because I'd always, if I bought something that I couldn't quite afford, it yeah. would always drive me to work harder to make sure I could sure. pay for it. But um, I don't even know if I've answered your question there, but you've got a nice, yeah, no, I mean, I think nice story of understanding your life. paper route and buying your Premier League stickers, paper I think that, round, yeah, man. yeah, absolutely it's important. But how, how do you, so you know, in your view, how do you delay that gratification? Because I think that is a, tough. a major factor at the moment that, you know, the world is moving at such a pace yeah. and people want it all today and you know it just doesn't happen yeah. you know you can't buy 15 20 years of experience you have to live it yeah so how do you see you know how would you sort of suggest people navigate that in terms of delaying that gratification yeah, there's, there's no way to navigate you've just got to want it mm. right you've got to try and you have to see the bigger yeah. picture sure you you can't be in a situation where you do well for a you know a, a year or you you know you earn a bit of money and and, and you spend it on something yeah. that isn't gonna grow in value or is unlikely to grow in value Mm. I mean my wife tells me that bags are investments but I don't believe it Hermes ones Hermes maybe yeah 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 Yeah, yeah, but like I I think realistically (laughs) probably not I try and do the same with watches in fairness it's investment yeah it's not an investment well sort of maybe but yeah I just just like the watch you have to enjoy some of the yeah of course you do yeah if you if you if you you know kill yourself to the to the point where you're saving ninety percent of your income, yeah. and you're not enjoying yourself, yeah. then you're it's it's gonna reach a point where you just can't do it anymore, and then you yeah. maybe do make a stupid decision, yeah. because you, you know you simply can't bear to save anymore. Yeah. So I think there's got to be a balance, mm. um, and you have to enjoy it. You have to enjoy your life. Mm. But um, I don't really think there's any direct, there's no, there's no magic formula for how yeah. you can try and delay mm. gratification. You just have to believe mm. that you're going to get to where you want to be and yeah. you have to accept yeah. that if you can remain disciplined, mm-hmm. that it will pay for itself tenfold mm-hmm. when you actually get there. You know, you can buy all the bags and watches and cars and things you want once yeah. you're there. Yeah. Um, but there's no, unfortunately, aside from discipline, there's not any magic formula yeah. for it. I mean, and, and discipline is huge. I mean, I think that mm. if there's a key takeaway around delaying gratification or just really being deliberate about what you're going after and really understanding that nothing comes overnight. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think it's easier said than done, but I think you have to believe it, as you say. But now you're a parent, you're a dad. What are you going to teach them about money? Oh, man, it's going to be tough. And I've, I've struggled with this all the time because cause I, 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 knew, I, I knew bits about money Mm -hmm. but I didn't know I I really didn't know everything and my concern with my kids is that they're gonna grow up thinking what they have is normal right I sound like my dad but it's gonna be really hard to make to give them what I want to give them because you do all of this to to level up right to give you the next generation every every generation should be a platform for the next right that's what you do yeah so I want to give them a great life, yeah. but I want them to understand that they, they don't just get given it, you know, they have to work for it. In terms of the actual financial lessons, mm. um, I'm going to try and teach them everything that I know mm. with regards to how to invest and what to do and how to protect your money longer term and how to invest. Because that is something I have genuinely had to basically teach myself in the yeah. last few years. Yeah. 
um, you know, you suddenly do really well and you've got money to invest and you're like, what do I do? And you yeah. make some stupid choices yeah, yeah, yeah. and you go on some silly holidays and buy some silly things. Yeah. But um, and there's an, and that's a whole that I mean, that could be a whole other podcast. Sure. There needs to be so <laughs> yeah, much yeah. more education, like the fact yeah. that I'm sitting in school learning pie mm. or like doing doing cooking and food technology when I could be being taught about how to manage my money. Yeah. Just blows my mind yeah, yeah, that there's yeah. not more education yeah. and there's a whole nother conspiracy we can go into as to why yeah, there's yeah. not education well i think look yeah. financial literacy is is super important, so um, important yeah. and i think that's why you know for me i think this book is hopefully a start off that giving huge, people yeah. something that you know packages a holistic approach of understanding how to make yeah. money how to grow it, and how to keep it most importantly mm -hmm. um but looking at your experience overall then Grob, what do you think has been your best financial decision you've made oh um, my best financial decision was, honestly, it was probably buying my first flat when I did mm -hmm. and delaying that whole gratification that we spoke about. Right. I bought my first flat at 19, okay. 20. Um, and that was huge yeah. because that allowed me to level up from there. Mm. So as I started earning money, I was, yeah. I was able to level up. Yeah. Um, and the next best, although this is depends on how risk you, risk averse you are, or maybe the best was leveraging the assets I have okay. to buy more assets. Yeah. But the reason I say it depends how risk averse you are is because you're obviously taking on more debt. Sure. So you have to be comfortable with, with leveraging debt. Yeah. And that's where books and financial literacy can try and teach you about yeah. how to manage that debt yeah. and why that, and why debt isn't necessarily a scary thing sure. if you know what you're doing yeah because i don't know about you but i was definitely brought up in in a household and a generation that were terrified of debt <laughs> yeah. it was like you know put into your pension put into your savings account yeah. pay off the mortgage as quickly as you can yeah. when the reality is why would you be paying down a mortgage at one percent when you've got five percent return in the bank you wouldn't do that yeah. but i didn't even know that sure i had to teach myself that you right know? yeah so yeah great book yeah yeah <laughs> well look, it's all grand you're giving them all my secrets uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but no i think it is so important it's really just yeah. understanding for me financial literacy is understanding the options available to you and knowing how to navigate them to yeah. get the right outcome that sure, that is yeah. financial literacy yeah, yeah, you really sure. break it down and like you said knowing that actually if i'm being charged one percent but i'm earning ten percent then perhaps the, you know i'm still net better off and therefore exactly. i can use my money to do other things rather than this mentality of debt is bad and actually mm. I have a line in it that says not all debt is bad debt exactly. it's really understanding I think some people are burdened with credit cards and overdraft and things that doesn't really contribute to any mm. growth now, that's not good debt mm. but actually you can use debt for good yeah. if you know how to use it yeah completely um, so now that's, that's a really good point you make so in the world of business and entrepreneurism finance property is there anyone you look up to is there anyone that you sort of ah, too <laughs> kind god Listen, pay this man already. I think you, I think you take, uh, I think you can, you know, you, you can look up to so many different people. And I think as you get older, you realize that you don't know it all, right? Like yeah. I thought I knew it all at 18 and then yeah. thought I knew it all at 30. Yeah. And you start to realize that you don't and you can take bits of it. You can take bits from everyone. Mm. You know, I had a coffee with a chap the other day, much younger than me. But as I say, age is no guarantee of anything because... Yeah even though he said that there was lots I was doing that was inspiring him, there were yeah. things he was saying that I was like, oh, wow, that's a really good idea. Mm. So I think you can take it from everywhere. I wouldn't say there's a specific person in that world that I look up to. Mm -hmm. I am going to be really naff and say my dad is oh. the only person that I look up that's to, the, really, yeah, in amazing. that sense. Sure. Um, yeah. Just because of the, he was the person that really gave me the work ethic. Yeah. And I think everything in the world comes back to work ethic. It's yeah. how much you want it, how much you want to go after it. Yeah. Uh, and that builds your, your resilience. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't say there's a specific person. I think okay. you can take things from lots of people. Yeah. Um, and tell them when you do, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think as well. I know you didn't really ask that, but I'm all yeah. for like just messaging people and being like, that was amazing. You know, uh, as I say, at the top, everyone collaborates. Yeah. At the bottom, you, you compete, so. Yeah. Amazing answer. God, I, li I like that one. So if you were to look at, you know, just sort of summing, summing up the conversation then really, if you look at where you are on the ladder mm. to your personal success, how, how close are you or how far are you to that destination you're trying to get to? Um, in in my head, I've said 45. I'm okay. 37 now. Mm -hmm. So in my head, I've said, I want to be out by 45. Okay. I want to be, you know, 
I want to be going to the gym at 11 o'clock. Yeah. I want to be picking up my kids. Yeah. Like, that's what I want to do. Sure. I want to be out by 45. Yeah. Is it realistic? Um, probably not. I think probably 50 would be where I'd, where I'd be. But um, I think you've always got to set yourself a goal that's ahead yeah, yeah. of where you expect to be. Yeah. So I think I'm relatively close ish. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's still so much more to more that can be done. Yeah. I definitely wouldn't say I have designs on being a billionaire. Okay. Like I don't think I, and maybe that's surprising to say, I don't have designs on being one of these people buying a 50 million pound house. Right. Yeah. I think I've learned and, and I accept that I'm in a bit more of a f- position where I'm able to make this choice, yeah. but I don't personally see mm-hmm. that it gets you much more. I think you get to a point with wealth where there's not what else are you trying to achieve? Just numbers. Yeah, like mm-hmm. if I if I got to a point where all my family were comfortable, I was comfortable, I had yeah. assets coming in, bringing in val- uh, bringing in enough money to have a really nice life, go on the, the couple nice holidays a year, you know, have some nice material things. That's fine for me. Yeah, I'm out. Maybe though, I'll get to that, and then I'll be like, now nah, I want to be a billionaire. I need more. Well, but no, I, I, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned that because one of the characters in the book yeah. has that dilemma of setting a target, and once they achieved it. They wanted more. Yeah, well, that's and once the thing, they achieved that, that they is. wanted more. But look, I mean, I think it'll be a nice problem to have once you get there. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but for now, I mean, I think I just want to say that you know, based on the work that you're doing mm. um, and how you've mon- modernized, you know, a very traditional market, I think is incredible. Thank uh, you. I man. think you're making a real difference. And you know, for those who are looking at getting into the world of property, I mean, it's great to have this aspirations of the properties you sell, but also understanding the fundamentals you described in terms of really taking care of the basics and then building your way up yeah it's super important so look please keep doing what you're doing um and yeah thank you very much for joining thank me you, in man. this conversation I'm, I'm really excited by it can we give a grant a massive round of applause i don't know why i'm clapping myself <laughs> give us all a clap. you. thank you excellent uh,